Well, good morning, church. I trust you have already been refreshed uh, through worship, and it's only in Christ. He is our Lord. He's our Savior, and I know I've been refreshed, and I've been blessed. I don't know about you, but I, I love songs, and I love singing, and I love worshiping God in that way. This morning, grab your Bibles, turn again back to Galatians. We'll look at chapter 5 this morning. And our key passage this morning will be verses 13 through 15. Today, if you want to just look at this freedom in, that uh, Paul tells the Galatians that they have in Christ. And so, if you want to look at what are we going to do with all this freedom that God gives us? And how are we going to use this freedom? You know, most people think that Christianity is more about restrictions than freedom, right? If you would uh, tell people, I just can't believe all the freedom that I have in Jesus. I just can't believe all the freedom I have at Living Gospel Church. They would look at you and they would say, are you out of your mind? Because they think it's way more about what you shouldn't do than the freedom that you have that you can do and that you should do. Many people in the world are like this. And, and, and let me tell you, as a kid, I actually thought about this as well. Many people in the world, they think like this. I want to know God. I want to go to heaven one day. But I am going to wait. I first want to do what I want to do whenever I want to do it with whomever I want to do it. And so I just want to first do whatever I want to do. And so I'm just going to wait. And then just before I die, I'm going to ask God to save me and then go to heaven. But listen, there is so much wrong in that thinking. There's so much wrong in that thinking. That would mean that you are assuming that you will know when you will die. Many people don't get that option. Some may have a good idea when they're going to die, but many don't have that option. That is also assuming that just before you die, you will be ready to repent and receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. I mean, what, what, that's, again, that, that, just, that just doesn't work like that. That's just wrong. Because what makes you think that you're going to live for you and the way you want to and, and just live your sinful life and pleasing you, pleasing the flesh, that just before you are about to die, that you're going to be ready to repent and, and receive Christ? What makes you think that you will be ready at that time? I believe you might be scared to death because you know you're on your way to hell right now, right? I would be scared to death knowing that I'm going to go to hell today. Yes. And also, you know, it is God's saving, right? God saves us. Well, what makes us think that, that the Spirit of God is going to convict us and draw us and, 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 and show us? And I, don't, I do believe God has, can do whatever He wants. And He definitely, I believe, He has the power to save people the, two minutes before they die. I believe all of that. But what does that make us believe that we can wait for then? And that at that time, the Spirit of God is going to draw us and, and convict us and we will truly, genuinely, in our heart, sincerely are sorry for our sins in our lives and repent of it and receive forgiveness. I mean, we, we don't know that. You know, the Bible says, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. 
Well, if the Holy Spirit has convicted you and called you and drew you for 1,500 times, what makes you think that he's going to do it again one more time there? I mean, that's just wrong thinking. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. But people often think that's what they're going to do. There's so much wrong in that thinking. Now, here's another uh, thing that many uh, don't know. Real freedom, the freedom that we are looking today in Galatians, that's the real freedom. When I use the word real freedom, it's the freedom that we have been, in, we've been set free in Christ. The real freedom is not about doing things at, that you want at any time you want with whoever you want. That is not real freedom. That is actually slavery. You're, sl you're a slave to sin. You're a slave to your flesh. You're a slave to, to yourself. That is slavery. That's bondage. It's not freedom. This is what you want to write down and remember for the rest of your lives. Real freedom requires four things. Opportunity, ability, desire, and here's the very key point to it, and lasting joy. Lasting joy. That's real freedom. Now, let, let me give you an illustration what is not real freedom. That may sound like it's real freedom. It's only freedom to your flesh, but not real freedom. Now, just as an example... Here's a couple, they're young, they have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. She is gorgeous, beautiful, and she knows it. And she likes that attention. So she dresses so that every guy will turn eyes to her when they see her. And that also leads her to actually cheating on her spouse and eventually not just emotionally but also physically. Is she free? I mean, she can do whatever she wants, whenever she wants, with whomever he, she wants. Is, is, is that freedom? Will that give her lasting joy? That's where the key part comes in. Because the real freedom will give you also lasting joy. No. It's going to lead her. She's, that freedom that she claims is freedom is, going to, is leading her to her destruction. It leads to destruction. It leads to disaster. It, not only in her own life, she's going to have one of the most miserable lives anybody could ever have. In the name of her freedom. Did you, did you get that? She's going to destroy her children, her spouse, the families on both sides, the church. It leads to destruction. That's not real freedom, but people think that is real freedom. Now, give, let me give you one illustration. I um, really don't have much time for a bunch of illustrations. I want to get through the sermon because there's so much good in it. But let's, let's say you're, you're going skydiving. How many of you have ever done skydiving? Raise your hand. There's a few of you. I'm glad because I didn't want to be the only one here. Now, suppose you are free. You, you have the opportunity. You have the desire. You have the ability to skydive. Okay? Now, you call that freedom. You have, you're free to do whatever you want. And you go skydiving and... They open the door and you jump out of the plane and you see you're about five, seven thousand miles in the, uh, feet in the air and you're falling to the ground about 120 miles an hour and, and you're thinking to yourself, this is one of the most amazing things I've ever done in my life. You open up that parachute and it opens and it's not opening. Well, you've been trained, you know how to do this, there's this main parachute and then there is the reserve parachute so you pull the other string and it gets tangled up with the strings 
by the way, when I went parachuting, actually my son's parachute, the instructors, their strings were tangled up as well, but they ended up in a corn stubble, but safely they didn't. But let's say your parachute doesn't open, and, and now you start screaming for help. Nobody hears you, and even if they do, they can't help you. And you crash to your death. Were you free? I mean, in our own flesh, we were free. Because you had opportunity and the desire, the, uh, the ability. But it led you to your own destruction. It did not lead you to lasting joy. Freedom is more than just simply doing whatever you want to do. This real freedom that Paul is talking about is the opportunity, the ability, and the desire. And that will also bring you the deepest joy 10,000 years from now. That's real freedom. Many people, what they think is real freedom actually leads to their own destruction. Often we can look at people that sleep around and we think, oh, that looks like they have a lot of fun. Or we see people building their lives up on greed and lust and pride and power and violence or fame and, and we just think that must be real life. It must be so much fun. But they have just jumped out of the plane and that chute isn't deploying. It's not opening up. True freedom is something that gives you joy 10,000 years from now. That is true freedom. That's real freedom. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. We talked about this last Sunday, that we are free from so many things, and we are now free to do so many things. And so Paul says, you have been set free by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are free. You are free, so now enjoy it. Enjoy your freedom you have in Christ. It is not the freedom in the flesh. It's the freedom in Jesus Christ. Enjoy it. Listen, this coming week at VBS, we're going to enjoy our freedom in Christ. Because we got a bunch of kids to serve and love. We are free and now enjoy it. Don't go back into the bondage of sin or the bondage of legalism. Now, if you look at our key verses, verses 13 through 15, Paul tells us what we are and not are to do with all our freedom. Check it out. Let me read verse 13 through 15. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, Watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So what is, are we going to do with all this freedom? He says two things. Two things that we need to focus on. One is a negative command and one is a positive command. That we are free to do. We have the opportunity to do. He says, don't use this opportunity for the flesh. So in other words... In our gospel freedom, we must fight our flesh daily. That's what the Bible says. Fight your flesh daily. Verse 13, let me read it again. It says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Now, as Christians, we don't have the right to do whatever we want to do. See, that's selfish, right? That's the flesh. We now have the power and also the desire to do what we ought. There's a tremendous change when it changes from the flesh to Christ and our freedom. So Christian freedom is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin, right? Right? That's the division that, that changes it from the flesh to the spirit. 
Now, Paul acknowledges something I think is very worth noting. This may be a little bit on the weaker side that I often not mention so much, which maybe I should. And that is that we still struggle with sin. We are free from the penalty of sin, but yet we are not yet free from the presence of sin. That is not going to happen until we will stand face to face with Jesus. All of us still feel a pull within us to do and say and think what we know is wrong. You know, there's still a part in our heart that yearns to please ourselves in a way that we know is displeasing to God. There's still that battle that is within us. And why is it? Because we still, on the inside of us, we have what's called the flesh. And what is the flesh? It is the inner desire for selfish enjoyment or, or selfish satisfaction that is at the expense of God or other people or, or what is not true and honest and right before God. So in other words, I'm going to do what I want to do. At any cost, I want to do it. The flesh is all about self. The flesh is self-centered. It is self-consumed. Now, that part doesn't go away completely when we get saved. And that is why, even though we have been forgiven perfectly, we still don't always live perfectly. It's because the flesh, the presence of the flesh is within us. So now you have both. You have the flesh, and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and they are at war against each other. They're in conflict with one another every day. Now, let me give you uh, a few things that we need to know about the flesh and, and how to fight against it. One is that without Christ, flesh rules. The flesh will rule. When Christ is not on, sitting on the throne of our hearts, then flesh is. Whoever sits on the throne of the heart rules. So if Christ isn't sitting on the throne, then our flesh is. In other words, we ourselves are. Then we rule. Um, look at Romans chapter six, 8, verse 6. Chapter 8, verse 6. It says this, and it really makes so much sense. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. See, when we have the spirit on the throne, that produces life and peace. Now, without Christ, I mean, excuse me, with Christ, now when Christ comes in, flesh backs off. Flesh has to back off. It retreats. And, and I'm going to read Romans chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, and also verse 11 through 14, just to see that when Christ comes in, then flesh retreats. Flesh backs off. It says in verse 5, it says, If we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that the old, our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. And then pick up in verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign to your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather your, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law. You are under grace. Now, without Christ, the flesh rules. And then it will win. And it will get what it wants. But it will lead either to destruction or death. But it's not going to give you lasting, deep, lasting joy. But when God's Holy Spirit moves into our life, when we are saved, 
now we have the desire and the power to say no to the flesh. I don't have to serve the flesh anymore. I, I now have a choice. Now I have a choice. Even though we don't always do what we're supposed to do. But now we at least have the capability in us to obey our Father instead of our flesh. But the question that you may have is then, well, why, I, I, why do I still sin? I mean, I know I have the ability, the ability to obey and do what's right, but why do I still make wrong or sinful decisions and choices? You know, even then, because as I mentioned earlier, we have the flesh that is still within us as well. Even when the Holy Spirit is present, even with Jesus Christ in our life, flesh still rebels. Flesh wants to rebel. We are not totally free from the flesh until we make it to heaven. And so God gives us the Spirit to rule over us, but this flesh battles against the Spirit that is inside of us. In Galatians chapter 5 or 17, Paul says this to them. He says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. We feel this every day, don't we? I mean, every wrong action, every wrong word, every wrong idea, every wrong reaction, every wrong emotion, every wrong attitude is from the flesh. The reason we have fear is the flesh. The reason we have terrible relationships is the flesh. The reason we have difficulty in marriage the flesh. The reason we have difficulty in a family, it's the flesh. The reason we have difficulty cooperating with other people, it's the flesh. The reason we have pride, it's the flesh. All sin of every form, all wrong emotions, wrong attitudes, wrong actions, wrong reactions, wrong thoughts, wrong words, wrong deeds, they all come out of the flesh. The fight against my flesh is a constant battle. The Bible calls it dying to self because it's going to be a constant battle. Now, Jesus knew how hard this was going to be for us, and so he knew how challenging this would be for ourselves, and that is why Jesus says that if anyone wants to follow me, he must take up his cross and follow me daily. He knew how hard that would be. And when he says, he must. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, he says, you must. That's a strong word. And then he says, you must when? Once a year, once every two years, or every my birthday? No, he says, daily. You must daily. Our selfishness and self-centeredness has to be re-crucified every day. This must be a daily thing. Why? Listen, the temptations that you can defeat today will be back tomorrow. That's why you re-crucify that daily. You know, maybe you have issues or problems with watching evil and dirty images that are uh, disgusting to God. But today, I, I, I decided I am no longer falling into those temptations. I am, the, the temptations will be there. We know that. But I'm not going to fall into it and do it. And you have victory over that temptation today. And you know, you were really tempted, but you resisted. You could withstand him. And guess what? Tomorrow, though, that temptation is back. That's why you, you must pick up your cross daily, he says. We have to die to self. The Christian life is a crucified life. If you don't understand this, you can very easily get frustrated and just feel like giving up. That's what a lot of people do. 
Because the truth is, living the Christian life isn't just hard. It's impossible. If you still have the flesh that, that rebels, and, and there's times that it will. And that's also why we have to understand that we need everyday grace. We need forgiveness. I, I like to think we don't go and sin every day. I, I hope not, but, but we will sin. We, we, we will do wrong. We, we will fail. Because even with Christ, our flesh still rebels. And there will be times where we completely failed to pick up our cross that day and follow Christ. So Paul says, don't give in to the flesh. Don't forget the fight. You must starve the monster. There's a monster in us, I call it. It's the flesh. Starve him. Make him weak. So he becomes less powerful. Because the more you feed the flesh, the more you feed self, the stronger it grows, the harder it is. It's like this old cowboy. He got saved. And he said, now that I'm saved, it feels like I have a, a black horse and a white horse inside of me and they are raging war against each other. They're, they're in conflict with one another. They're fighting with each other. They're pulling in different directions from each other. And the guy asked him, well, who wins? He says, the one that I feed the most. He always wins. You know, we, 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 we yield to the Spirit of God and the more we yield, the more we pick up our cross daily, the Spirit of God wins inside of us. But the more we feed self and our flesh, our, the monster self, then he wins. That's the one common command. It's a negative. Don't feed the flesh. Resist the flesh. Resist the opportunities of sin. And then we have a positive. That should be our focus. That's a positive command. And this, we already talked a lot about this in our adult Sunday school class. Serve others lovingly. Let me read uh, verse 13b through 15 one more time. Serve one another humbly in love for the entire law. You want to fulfill the entire law of God? For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The flesh has you focus on yourself. The spirit has you focus on others. The flesh says, use your freedom for you. The spirit says, use your freedom for others. Paul says it's about serving other people. Not self-serving. It's not about you. It's about serving others. And, and one thing that I noticed when I studied this is, and it's worth noting, the emphasis is not really what we do for others. Have you noticed? The emphasis is not what you do for others. It's how you do it. That's the emphasis. How do you do it? I, I love it just because we have VBS this week. The emphasis is not what you do for others, it's, but it's how you do it with love. That is the, the law that, that, that forces us to serve. Excuse me. It's not the law. It's, it's the, the love that forces us to serve, not the law. The law says, do this, do that. But love is what forces us. Love is what fuels us. Love is what energizes us to serve. Here's where these Judaizers that came and tried to deceive the Galatians really missed it. They made a big mistake. They thought the only way to change human behavior is giving them a bunch of laws, rules to follow and obey. And that doesn't work. But listen, Christianity works. Why does Christianity work? It changes the heart. And when we have a true change heart, it comes from the inside out. And what is it? That is the love that energizes us, that empowers us to serve others. 
to fulfill the whole law? One command, love one another. So he says, love one another. Now what happened when people don't love each other in the church the way they're supposed to? He says that in verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. A church full of people that don't love and serve one another, eventually they will hurt and destroy each other. And we see that a lot these days, don't we? Just a week and a half ago, a pastor in town told me that he had resigned the day before. There was a church split, and uh, whether he's on right, in, in my understanding, or wrong, it doesn't matter. But not all that long ago, there was another church in our community, split probably about in half. We see that everywhere. You know, the freedom in Christ that has set us free in Christ, that freedom plus love will always equals to serving others. When we look at our key passage, we can clearly understand how love fulfills the whole law. Because it's the lack of love that caused men to hate their parents, commit murder, commit adultery, to steal and lie, or even suicide. It's a lack of law that leads to bitterness, anger, threats, and abuse. It's the lack of love that leads us to push people around and demand our own way, arguing over minor issues, and it divides the body of Christ. If we truly love our neighbors, like Jesus calls us to do and the freedom that he has given us, this sin will not remain. This sin will not be able to be present. Where God's love reigns, sin cannot abide. It disappears. You know, there's always something inside of us that just wants to demand I need to be on top. I need to have the credit. I want the attention. I want to be admired. And there's something inside of us that's the selfish part that wants that. The Bible even says, don't use your gifts and your talents for self, but for God's glory. Are you serving somebody today, anywhere, without any concern for credit, or glory, or praise, or personal benefit. Simply, you are serving people, helping people, loving people, only to, for their better and for God's glory and honor. What are we going to do with all our freedom? Are we going to use it to focus on self, or are we going to use our freedom to serve others with the love of Jesus Christ? That's what it's all about. That is what we are free to do. Serve other people. Now, I have no idea what's been going through your mind and what the Spirit of God has told you through the message. Or, or you know, one thing I know that we all fall short from the glory of God sometimes. And we fail and we, 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 we forgot to pick up our cross that day. Or maybe we forgot to pick up the cross at a moment of, of an instant time and we did something that was not honoring to God because that's what the flesh does. That's what the flesh wants. It's all about the heart. It comes back down to the heart. If we are truly free in Christ for what he has set us free, then our hearts will be changed. Our hearts will be different. And so whatever the Spirit of God has revealed to you this morning, would you be obedient to that? Because that is, the Spirit of God says everything that God tells him to do and what to, that God tells him to say. And if he has, maybe you, maybe you are some words where you have really messed it up. Or, or maybe you have been cheating on your spouse. It may not even been physical, maybe just emotionally. Maybe you have committed infidelity with your wife and maybe it's just because she did not remain number one in your life 
your work was number one or your money was number one. And that's, that's infidelity. Because your wife didn't got the attention and she wasn't number one. Or, or maybe you understood that loving others meant just your close friends. It didn't mean love your neighbor as yourself. That means selfishness has to die, right? In order to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. That's big if you think about it. My question is, can you and can I can we truly humble ourselves before God, bow ourselves before God, and become that true, free, Christian follower of Jesus Christ and love and serve people with the love of Christ? And if you ever need prayer, our leadership would gladly pray with you. I gladly pray with you. But can we truly be right with God? There is that war inside of us. There's no denying. But let's crucify it daily. Pick up our cross daily. And I don't know what you do in your life or what's going on in your, your week. Or maybe your coworker or your boss or your employee. Your attitude, wrong attitude that's from the flesh, wrong motives, wrong emotions is from the flesh. Join me in a closing prayer. Lord God, we, we look at your word and we are so free in you, Jesus. But yet so many times the flesh wants to be in the way. The flesh stands in the way for even for us to be able to, to comprehend that or understand that freedom that we have in you, Jesus. But today we see that the flesh still rebels, it's still present, and it's not going to be completely gone until you take us home, Jesus. And so many times we, we yield to the flesh and we let the flesh have power. But today I pray that we would just renew afresh our commitment to you and say we want to truly be followers of you, Jesus. We want to die to self daily, pick up our cross daily. We want to follow you daily. And where we have failed, would you forgive us and cleanse us and purify us? And help us to go into this week and as we're going to be serving and, and caring for kids or the kids that will come and will be served and have a great time learning about you and how good and how loving, how gracious you are. I pray that we will be able to go out and serve others with your love, Jesus Christ. Give us that strength and power, that desire, and help us when the temptations come, that we will resist them as they will come daily. In Jesus' name, amen.